Hello, and welcome to Conversations from the World of Allergy, a podcast produced by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I'm your host, Dave Stukas. I'm a board-certified allergist and immunologist and serve as the social media medical editor for the Academy. Our podcast series will use different formats to interview thought leaders in the world of allergy and immunology. This podcast is not intended to provide any individual medical advice to our listeners. We do hope that our conversations provide evidence-based information. Any questions pertaining to one's own health should always be discussed with their personal physician. The Find an Allergist search engine on the Academy website is a useful tool to locate a listing of board-certified allergists in your area. Finally, use of this audio program is subject to the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Terms of Use Agreement, which you can find at www.aaai.org. Today's edition of our Conversations from the World of Allergy podcast series is targeted towards clinicians who treat patients with asthma as well as researchers, and I think you'll see why as we get into the, the subject matter at hand. And today's guest is Dr. Jonathan Bernstein. Dr. Bernstein is the current president of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. He is a professor of clinical medicine in the Division of Rheumatology, Allergy, and Immunology at the University of Cincinnati, where he has a laboratory for clinical and investigator-initiated trials. In addition, Dr. Bernstein also treats patients and conducts clinical research through the Bernstein Allergy Group and the Bernstein Clinical Research Center, also in Cincinnati, Ohio. Dr. Bernstein joined us on the podcast shortly after beginning his term as the Academy President and returns today to discuss the recent consensus of an American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and American Thoracic Society Workgroup on Definition of Clinical Remission and Asthma on Treatment. Dr. Bernstein, thank you so much for taking time to join us today, and welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Dave, for having me. Yeah, th I think this is going to be a wonderful discussion. Uh, but before we get into the, the topic, you know, time really does fly by when you're having fun, and it's hard to believe, but you're already halfway through your term as president. How's everything going so far? Well, it's going quite well. I mean, it, it's, it obviously goes fast. Uh, there's, you never know what's going to uh, come up each day. Uh, so there's some, uh, you know, uh, surprises, but nothing serious. And uh, it's nice to uh, be able to, uh, you know, really see what, how the, the organization works from uh, the inner, the inner uh, from the inside uh, and to really uh, get a sense of, you know, a better sense, a great appreciation of the organization and how much it really does and, and it's really contribute to our specialty. It, I don't think it's very, it's not even possible to understand that just being a member or even doing uh, attending meetings, you really need to be in leadership positions to really understand, uh, you know, what goes on in this organization. That's why I really encourage all of our members to really put themselves out there and to volunteer and to participate and to get involved. And I think they'll find it's a, just like I have, it's a gratifying experience. Oh, that's great. And I know it keeps you very busy. Is there anything specific that you're looking forward to before our next annual meeting in February 2024 when you'll turn the gavel over? Uh, are there exciting initiatives or any travel uh, coming up for you? Well, of course, there's uh, the uh, November board meeting that will be held in Washington, D.C., and certainly we have a full agenda. But the um, there's the uh, course, the program director's winter meeting where there's, everyone gets together, the, you know, there's different, many different meetings occurring com concomitantly. Uh, I'll be attending that as well. Uh, the, uh, I think that there's a lot of exciting things. The, the program for this year's meeting is extremely exciting. The theme is neuroimmunology. That's the presidential plenary. Uh, there are several, you know, speakers will be uh, uh, talking about uh, conditions that we commonly treat as allergists, immunologists that are not necessarily IgE mediated, uh, that are neurogenic, uh, but, but interface with the, the uh, immune mechanisms that we're very familiar with. Uh, the, uh, I'm also very excited about the new program this year, the Discovery Program, which is a basic, more of a basic translational research program that will attract a lot of our young investigators and our uh, researchers uh, to participate uh, there are um, some newer initiatives. There's going to be the beginning, the first of hopefully several forums to come that will be discussing uh, health disparities in uh, uh, in regions of the different regions of the world uh, to really uh, for us to have a better perspective, not just what's going on in this country, uh, but to understand what's going on uh, in other countries. We are an international organization, and we certainly need to be 
uh, involved in, in in these areas as well, uh, and be sensitive or empathetic to the the, the, the problems and the issues that our colleagues have in these countries, because uh, they don't have access to all the therapies or even the care that, that we are lucky to have in the United States. Uh, I also I'm very excited about my initiatives, uh, Vadia, where volunteerism addressing environmental disparities and allergy and that's moving along, moving along very nicely. We have a uh, almost completed uh, a call to action uh, paper. Uh, we've renamed the white paper the call to action. And uh, uh, Maha uh, from Rush uh, University is taking the lead on that. But uh, uh, we have a, a great uh, group of people involved in that project. We are. Uh, putting together an RFA that will actually help fund several research projects uh, throughout the United States addressing uh, that will uh, allow uh, us to uh, implement some of these volunteerism programs addressing uh, environmental disparities. And then uh, we're doing some other initiatives as well. So that's coming along very nicely and a lot going on. Uh, you know, I, those are just a few highlights. Uh, but uh, so far, I can tell you that things are in good shape with the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, and uh, uh, the future is, is, is very bright. Oh, that's great. Boy, like you said, there's a, there's a lot going on. And uh, for our listeners, stay tuned. We will have future episodes dedicated specifically to the new discovery program. And then if we always have our uh, the chair of the annual meeting program committee come on to talk about, you know, what we can expect at the annual meeting. So that's great. Well, you know, Let's move on to today's topic. Let's just start. Can you just offer some background as to how and why this work group of three different organizations came together? Well, I think there uh, was increasing evidence that uh, there is a need for a definition of permission that's being it was being used uh, uh, in uh, studies, mostly industry sponsored studies, uh, discussing the term remission and, and uh, claiming remission. It was felt that. Uh, that it's important that the organizations actually uh, really have a say in terms of what uh, constitutes remission. So I think this was the impetus, uh, given the importance of real world uh, data, real world research, uh, and more and more uh, in how we uh, how we uh, approach our patients. We use this information to really uh, to manage our patients, uh, not just guidelines that are you know, either Delphi or grade methodology, but also uh, the real world data. Uh, so we needed to have better understanding of what does constitute remission for asthma. And uh, so this was led by uh, a number of uh, individuals. Uh, this actually, this initiative began uh, at the college. Uh, Dr. Corbett was uh, one of the individuals who led this initiative and uh, and brought us in, which was, uh, and then also was able to bring in the APS as well. So it's been a true collaboration between the different organizations to develop this um, uh, document. Mm. Well, you know, traditionally, we've always been taught to focus on achieving good asthma control for our patients. How do we define and or measure good control? Well, that's, you know, of course, we have patient report outcome measures. You know, we have asthma control tests. We have, uh, you know, quality of life questionnaires, uh, and these are also, these are all very important, uh, and we use objective evidence, we have, you know, we use objective evidence, spirometry, now people are using more and more ENO, uh, and so really having objective and subjective evidence to establish control, you know, utilization of resources is also very important, where people are going to, are they having um, unexpected or unscheduled office visits or emergency room visits or hospitalizations, so, you know, Overusing you know, rescue medications, uh, all of this continues. To, uh, all, all this contributes to morbidity and uh, poor control and, and, and uh, overutilization of healthcare resources. So, so I think there's a number of variables that we use to establish control. There are obviously, uh, you know, people are using prednisone four times a year. Is that control? Uh, no. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. so we have uh, we have to use a compilation of, uh, of parameters to really establish control. And as you mentioned, you know, we've never really used that term remission for asthma for multiple reasons. You know, it's a chronic condition, it's variable over time. And I think a lot of us have just been hesitant to tell somebody, oh, your asthma's gone away. Don't worry about your inhaler anymore. So how has remission been defined for other conditions? Well, that's a good question, you know, it, because it, it does have different connotations for different diseases, you know, um, in terms of 
whether people are still taking medications or off medications, you know, is this control or is this truly remission uh, or is it cure? And does remission mean cure? And I don't think it really means cure. So I think it means that it's, 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 it's very well controlled uh, when people are in remission and it means that patients are able to step down, but uh, to the minimal amounts of medications necessary to maintain control where they are not having symptoms, they're not, their lung function is well preserved, is, is controlled, they're, um, they're not uh, missing school, they're not missing work, they're not ending up in the emergency room, you know, all of these factors uh, would, would really, uh, this, is, this is how we've used this to really uh, di you know, define remission. Uh, but if you're talking about cancer, you know, uh, remission is that there's no evidence of active disease, you know, and that, uh, uh, and patients are typically off therapy where, you know, the chemotherapy is completed or respiratory therapy is completed there, uh, or they have a surgical procedure and there's no evidence of, you know, nodal involvement or other you know, organ system involvement and patients are, you know, considered in remission. Does that mean they can't have a reoccurrence? No, it doesn't. Um, but, and, and those patients still need to be monitored. So, so I don't think the, the term remission should, should be confused with cure. Yeah, that, that's excellent perspective. And I, just to, to touch upon some very important messages that I heard you say. So one, remission does not mean cure. Um, two, remission means that symptoms can come back again, uh, which leads me to my next question as to why did the work group decide to develop criteria for asthma clinical remission and specifically include while on treatment? Yeah, and I, I think that's uh, I, that was a, a point of discussion, you know, because uh, uh, and I think that the, the, the group felt that, you know, remission doesn't mean cure and that, you know, you, if, if you have someone who's extremely well controlled on a biologic uh, or, you know, even on conventional therapy uh, and they're not symptomatic when they're exercising, when they get a viral infection, it doesn't induce an exacerbation. Uh, you know, these are the triggers that normally would cause problems in patients with asthma. This doesn't uh, happen. I think that, you know, that is, you would you would say this patient is, is uh, controlled now and, 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 poss and, and probably in remission. However, uh, there's uh, if you stop all the medications, everything, uh, will they still remain in remission? We don't have data for that right now, and we don't even necessarily have data to support the definition that we came up with. This is a Delphi consensus opinion. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we did the best we could given the circumstances as to what uh, the current state of, you know, the status is. Uh, and I think that we needed to take the lead here uh, as an allergy immunology organization uh, group uh, because if we didn't do this and it would be defined for us. And, mm. and, and since we are the, the people who are managing these patients, it's important that we have a say as to what, the, what, what constitutes remission. And the bar was set quite high. Uh, and in fact, uh, it was very high before the final document and we did uh, loosen it up a little bit by allowing rescue medication, you know, uh, you know a, a limited amount of rescue medication more frequently than twice a year. So mm -hmm. like just like once a month or so, but you know, the, um, uh, but I think, generally speaking, it was important that uh, professional organizations, the physicians who are managing these patients and other providers uh, should really be the lead in, in these types of definitions. I'm really glad you brought that point up because I've had both conversations with other colleagues and been involved in different work groups that this has come up. And, and you know, the question inevitably is, well, you know, who are we to decide, you know, what constitutes remission or why are we doing this? Because it can be problematic, as we'll discuss. And as you mentioned, this was happening with or without us. And this was an opportunity for the true asthma experts to have a seat at the table and have some say as to what goes into this. So I think that's a really important point that you brought up. Yeah. Um, the consensus document discusses the term super responder, uh, which was actually something I had not been familiar with prior to reading this. What is a super responder and how should we incorporate this into thoughts surrounding asthma remission? Well, I, I think it really is what it says. You know, patients really do respond very well to treatment. They, you know, when they're on this, you know, it's like an amazing response. They their disease completely improves. Uh, and it's a it's beautiful thing to see where patients are really kind of a mess. You know, they're overutilizing their rescue therapy, they're 
you know, and they're, they're maxed out and, uh, you know, you put them on a biologic, for instance, this is one example. Uh, of course, it could also be an advancement of, uh, uh, with triple therapy, perhaps, but, but most of these examples relate to uh, biologics and, you know, where there's an incredible response where their inflammatory parameters uh, uh, go down or uh, go to, you know, to normal levels there. Uh, their clinical symptoms completely improve, and uh, and 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 that you can even see improvement in lung function with some of these biologics. So, so I think, and they and they remain stable. So, patients who were flapping in the wind uh, are now all of a sudden, you know, boring patients. You know, they're, they're coming now twice a year for monitoring of lung function and clinical symptoms, and and they're doing very well. And what we are having to uh, you know, one of the things I think physicians have a real difficult time doing is stepping down on therapy. We always kind of keep people on treatment uh, and say, okay, it's not broken, don't fix it, stay on your medication. But many times patients, you know, paper down themselves on treatment. Well, I'm only using the inhaler once a day now. But And, and then you say, well, you know, you, you should be really using this the way it's prescribed. And then you look at their parameters and say, wait a second, you know, you're looking great. You know, maybe you're right. Maybe we should be stepping down. So. Uh, and some have stepped off uh, some of the other topical therapies. Now, that precludes that people are going to be staying on biologics for forever. And that's the problem that we have right now is what are the endpoints? Uh, these are treatments that help control disease or put people into remission, but they're not necessarily curative. And they don't really, you know, if you stop these drugs, at least as we see in uh, the real world data or in uh, even some of the, uh, the clinical trials, the disease does seem to worsen and uh, come back. So uh, so I think we we still have a ways to go in terms of understanding the pathogenesis of asthma and really understanding how to truly turn it off. I think we can now get people to remission where they're very, very well controlled, but it's very difficult. We still don't have cures for this complex disease. Yeah, and for any patients listening, to go back to Dr. Bernstein's point, we don't want you to be boring as a person, but we absolutely want your conditions to become very boring over time. I like that a lot. <laughs> patients don't mind being boring. <laughs> no. Like yeah. Big change. Big change. Absolutely. <laughs> well, if it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, if it's okay with you, I'd, I'd really like to for our listeners to help orient them because this can be a lot that's kind of digest, and we'll we'll put links to the document as well, and you can read this on your own time. But I'd like to go through each of the six criteria individually and have you offer comments one at a time, if that's okay. Yeah. And, and it should be mentioned for our listeners that in order to consider somebody in asthma clinical remission, they need to fulfill every single one of these criteria over a 12-month period of time. So before we get into the specifics, do you have any overarching thoughts or perspective, uh, you know, before we dissect each one? No, I, I think that the, the 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 definitions that we used in this document are really kind of intuitive and and things that we're very familiar with in terms of outcomes data, uh, in, in terms of you know uh, clinical trials, you know exploratory, primary, secondary exploratory endpoints, uh, and now we're we're trying to really put this into more of a real world sense and you know how we use this in the clinic because people don't operate like a clinical trial when they're managing patients. Absolutely. Okay. Well, all right. The first criteria reads no exacerbations requiring a physician visit, emergency care, hospitalization, and or systemic corticosteroid for asthma over a 12-month period of time. This one seems pretty straightforward. Is there anything else that we should consider with this? No, I think it's it's it's, it's quite obvious. You know, we don't we don't want patients to we want their lives we want them to live we want them to be able to um, uh, you know be in control of their disease not the disease in control of them and you know just to have an exacerbation two or three times a year think about this conceptually every four months even every six months that means there is disruption in your daily life there's disruption in your family there's disruption in school there's disruption in work uh leisure activities and these disruptions can last, you know, two to four weeks or longer. Some people, you know, and uh, this results in significant uh, burden of disease for these patients. So I think this is obviously one of the premier, one of the, uh, and these are endpoints in clinical trials, by the way. So, you know, <laughs> we're, we're looking at this uh, in terms of exact, that's the primary endpoint, right? For mm -hmm. biologics, no exacerbations or reduced exacerbations, not no, reduced. Yeah. Well, I hope our listeners are picking up on some some really key words you're you're using here. Disruption, 
burden. Um, so when we're trying to consider somebody in remission, we really want to, their asthma to be, as you stated, very boring <laughs> over the last 12 months. So that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, all right. The second criteria is actually a little more nuanced, and I'd love to hear some more perspective on this. And this one states, no missed work or school over a 12-month period due to asthma-related symptoms. So my first question to you is, what about somebody who has asthma and they also have influenza and they miss two days of work because they have coughed during that period of time? Like, how can we really apply this? Well, I think when you look at this in the context of the normal population, if patients are behaving like uh, someone who's in the normal population who doesn't have asthma, I, I don't think you can uh, call that asthma. But if they have, you know, typically the traditional asthma patient will have uh, prolonged symptoms after a viral infection. It will uh, you know, usually last uh, several days, weeks if it's not treated. In fact, uh, it's common for people to have post-viral coughs where they're coming in and they're they're having these coughing spasms and they can't stop it due to airway hyper-responsiveness uh, and increased inflammation. So that is what we're trying to stop and prevent. So a viral infection for two days, this is, this is no different than somebody who doesn't have asthma, that's normal. And, uh, but if they have a prolonged course where they require intervention, obviously that's not remission. Now, I think when you think about work or school, um, it's not just missing work or school, and we didn't include this, but as you well know, the term presenteeism, where you actually go to school, but you're not feeling good, you're sick, you're coughing, you're, you know, uh, you can't, you, know, you can't, you can't concentrate, you can't be efficient uh, at what you're doing. So I think we have to, you know, recognize that uh, this has broader um, implications. Uh, we, we don't, we, we just don't, we just don't want there to be associated morbidity at all. Uh, in these patients that would affect these uh, these important uh, life events. Okay, so moving on to the third criterion. This states stable and optimized pulmonary function results on all occasions measured over a 12-month period with a minimum of two measurements during the year. Two-part two question for this and then any other perspective you want to offer. How often should pulmonary function tests be obtained for each patient? And then can you also clarify what is meant by stable and optimized for this criterion? Well, as you know, there are some people who have completely normal lung function but still have asthma. They have airway hyper-responsiveness or their lung function declines and normalizes with control or therapy. Um, and, uh, but there are some people who have uh, reduced lung function uh, and some patients completely improve post-bronchodilators and others uh, have partial improvement. And uh, so they have some fixed airway obstruction. And that is, you know, this is a debatable issue. Is this a patient with asthma, COPD overlap, or just asthma that's had, you know, you know chronic disease where there's been loss of lung function over time? And, uh, and now that they've been diagnosed and properly treated, you can prevent decline. The normal individual loses uh a, a certain number of cc's per year um you know 20 mls maybe a year 20 to 50. uh somebody who is uh, having asthma loses, who's losing more than that obviously that's what we're trying to prevent which is uh, the normal loss uh with age irrespective of an underlying lung disease uh so we, we monitor lung function. I, you know, I personally still use peak flows uh, and because I can correlate the peak flow with FEV1. And if they have a FEV1, if, they, if their FEV1 is, let's say, 100% and their peak flow is 550 and they have a 550 when they come in uh, and a visit, and then I say, well, do I really want to go get another FEV1? But that being said, uh, I think that guidelines indicate that lung function should be measured at least once a year and if appropriate, uh, uh, twice a year is recommended here. I, you know, this is, uh, of course, a consensus. This doesn't mean everyone 100% agrees or, uh, but, you know, I think you're gonna have to use clinical judgment uh, here, but uh, at least uh, in my mind, at least once a year here, they're saying twice, um, you know, if you're in remission, you may not see these patients more than once a year sometimes. So. Uh, so we really have to take this with, uh, you know, you have to use clinical judgment. But but the, the general intention is, is that you can't just go by an ACT. You can't just go by a patient for history. Uh, you have to do objective measurements and, and patients should have stable FEV1 and FEF2575. And 
uh, you know, you, you shouldn't be seeing uh, significant fluctuations beyond what you would see with a normal uh, loss of lung function with age. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that's very helpful. And, you know, it's interesting, I, my interpretation, and this may not have been the intent of the of the work group, but you, if you have a stable patient and you see them once a year, that's still a 12-month period, right? So if I see them every December, I'm still getting two pulmonary function tests within a 12-month period. So that would easily satisfy those criteria. Yeah, and I, and I, and I, yeah, I think you're, I think you're correct. I think that uh, if you're, it depends where you, if, if they come in before the next fiscal year. <laughs> okay, so otherwise it's, it's once. <laughs> right, there you go, right. If you're a day late, it doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't count. But I think you're right. I think that the intent would be uh, to do that. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, we try to also recognize that we have to be cost effective too in terms of really managing our patients. And, you know, we, at the end of the day, we are our patient's advocate and we're going to do what's best for them, okay? Not what's best for us. Mm -hmm. uh, what's best for them. And uh, this is what we do uh, as physicians. All right, let's move on to the fourth criteria. And this one reads, continued use of controller therapies, which includes inhaled corticosteroids, inhaled corticosteroids with LABAs, uh, leukotriene receptor antagonists, only at low to medium dose of inhaled corticosteroid or less, as defined by the most recent GINA strategy. This one seems a little more vague. Um, so can you just offer some additional insight regarding this criteria? Well, again, uh, we know the doses, you know, for we have different dose ranges and there's equivalencies between inhaled corticosteroids, but uh, you would say that, you know, there are some maximum doses of inhaled steroids. For instance, if you're using uh, nebulized budesonide, one milligram per ml is a high dose. Uh, if you're using uh, uh, fluticasone's uh, inhaler, 550. Uh, dry powder, that's a high dose, but, you know, moderate would be, you know, 250. So, you know, these are, we, if someone needs to be at that high of a dose, uh, are they really in remission? So it, it really provides some uh, understanding that patients can be, uh, can step down to lower doses, uh, suggesting that they don't require higher doses where there's a higher likelihood of systemic absorption and side effects. So, um, you know, we're trying to always use the least amount of medication to maintain control. Uh, so I think that that, you know, this, you, you could easily make the argument that patients shouldn't be on any medication if they're in remission, mm -hmm. uh, that their disease has gotten away. But again, as we talked about earlier, we are curing people. We are controlling patients extremely well so that they, uh, none of these other factors uh, uh, are a problem. So, so using low to medium, which are safe medications, well tolerated, uh, afford more affordable, cost effective uh, to maintain remission is um, what is recommended by GINA. Uh, it's also recommended by NHLBI. You know, I think they both kind of agree in that area that one wants to use the fewest amount of medications, the lowest dose as possible to maintain, to maintain uh, excellent control is what we're talking about. Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier in our conversation the use of these validated tools to measure and assess asthma control. And the fifth criteria applies to those tools. And it states that they need to have an ACT greater than 20, an ARIQ less than 2, an ACQ less than 0 0.75 on all occasions measured in the previous 12-month period with a minimum of two measurements during the year. So how often should these tools be used in clinical practice? Should, should this be every single time a patient with asthma comes to see us, even if it's for an unrelated reason? If they have asthma, they need to be, uh, this needs to be recorded. Uh, these are important, validated patient report outcome measures that establish control. And when you're at those levels that are specified, that really does indicate that they are not having any issues. Now, sometimes patients put these numbers down uh, and they say they're not having trouble, but then you check their lung function and, and they're a mess or their peak flow, whatever you do. And uh, because there is a discordance between objective patient report outcome measures and I mean uh, subjective patient report outcome measures and objective measurements in lung function because as you know asthma is an insidious disease and and many patients don't recognize that they're even having clinical symptoms there's this lack of sense of dyspnea and uh, so this is something we have to be uh, uh, very vigilant about uh, and again many times we see patients coming in with unrelated problems they're focused on their skin or they're focused on some reaction they had, uh, and they're not recognizing 
that their asthma might be the underlying contributing factor. And a case in point would be, you know, someone who underwent uh, 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 a, um, we just had a, a patient who had um, uh, a, a reaction to a, a tree nut, for instance, and, mm. and the problem was breathing issues. And she had no, she said she had no history of asthma. We, we looked at her peak flow that we took because it wasn't what she came in with. It was like 360, and it turns out that she had airway obstruction and significant reversibility uh, that was not recognized. So, uh, and so that may not be causing her reaction to tree nut, but certainly when she has that, it's going to make her much more, uh, uh, the reaction is going to be much worse. Okay. It's mm-hmm. similar to inducing anesthesia, you know, uh, very operatively. So, so I think we have to be vigilant, and I think we need to be consistent in terms of how we record this data. Uh, and the best way to do it is with these objective parameters. It, the, the important thing is trying to get these into electronic medical records. And some mm-hmm. of these electronic medical records really should have them populated automatically when, they, when patients come in and they have a listing of a problem that's asthma. Uh, and this is the only way we can really effectively do quality improvement and we can actually even do merit uh, myths, you know, to really understand, you know, our, you know, a, a better outcomes. So these are really important for those purposes, but also, you know, obviously to really stay on top of our patients. So uh, we are, we underutilize them as, as physicians and we need to, and this is true for any chronic disease because we have now have them for several diseases. We have them for urticaria, we have them for angioedema, we have, you know, we have a, a lot of uh, uh, objective validated uh, patient reported outcome measures. Or subjective patient mm-hmm. Well, you just gave me a flashback to the first five years of my career where I, I worked tirelessly to try to get clinicians to put the ACT score into the electronic medical record with the you know, dot phrases and automated. Oh my gosh. Uh, I guess I have some PTSD I'll work through on. on it my really own time. <laughs> needs, exactly. It really needs to be done by these uh, EMR, uh, the owners of these EMR systems. Yeah. Okay, so the the final, the sixth and final criteria reads, and this is the one that's probably going to have the most uh, conversation here, symptoms requ- requiring one-time reliever therapy, and this can apply to a short-acting beta agonist, a combined inhaled corticosteroid short-acting beta agonist, or a combined inhaled corticosteroid long-acting beta agonist, no more than once a month. And this one seems to have generated the most discussion and, and differs a bit from our traditional use of the rule of twos of, you know, using your albuterol twice a week and, you know, things like that. So I'd love to hear more about how the work group came to this decision. Yeah, and it, originally it was much less. It was twice a year, but there was, mm-hmm. you know, I think, some feedback from other colleagues uh, that felt that that was too rigid of a criteria because people uh, may do it for exercise. They may do it for you know, other reasons, um, you know, so I think that, uh, you know, hopefully we're going to get away from this idea of using Saba by itself. Uh, but right now we have the policies or the technology that we have developed and the research that we have developed does hasn't caught up with policies and, and um, or, you know, practical use in the, in the clinical setting. So uh, the, um, so I think this was a compromise, and this is what Delphi's are. Again, recognize there are no randomized trials for remission. This is all expert opinion consensus recommendations, and this was a this was a a, a compromise to make the uh, you know, at least not to be as as rigid. Um, we see problems with uh, short acting beta agonist use when people are using more than one canister a month. So one puff, uh, one or two puffs a month, uh, is not going to result in any increased morbidity. Some people do it just out of reflexive motion because they're used to being, you know, they're they're doing they're worried about you know something that traditionally would have caused them trouble. So they use it. Uh, so you don't even know why they're using it. Sometimes it's not necessarily that they're having truly bad symptoms, but Taking into account these other criteria, the patient reported outcome measures, the objective lung function, the other uh, endpoints, uh, I don't think that this is, uh, uh, I think this is reasonable. Uh, and one could still say the patient is extremely well controlled in remission. 
Mm -hmm. All right. So for just to kind of clarify, because I think people will probably automatically say, so if you have a patient who uses their short acting beta, beta agonist prior to exercise, and that prevents symptoms from occurring, um, and they are not having exacerbations, meet all the other criteria, they would not actually meet the definition for clinical remission, correct? Even though they're very well controlled. If they're, if they're not, I'm here, I missed your first point. Well, if they're using their short-acting beta agonist yeah. several times a week prior to right. exercise and no other right. symptoms. Right. I mean, exercise, you know, you have to differentiate exercise-induced bronchospasm from exercise as a trigger for, um, for asthma. You know, we don't, there are different mechanisms of action and there are different uh, conditions. So if someone is uh, running six times a week, but they, and they have exercise-induced asthma, um, should they be able to uh, should they be able to forego the bronchodilator before exercise? And this would be an area that would have to be uh, there'd be some discussion. It's still possible that they could be in remission, but it's doing they're treating exercise and bronch bronchospasm with the osmotic shifts in the airway. It's a different mechanism of action, and uh, versus the um, you know through you know, bronchospasm, smooth muscle dysfunction, early inflammation uh, pathways. So uh, it, it's not something that uh, was discussed. I mean, it was, it, it may have been, it, it was discussed, but not something that they felt that they needed to, uh, uh, you know, address in this particular definition. Um, so again, uh, this is not a perfect document. It's not necessarily a perfect uh, definition. It's this is a probably a working document that may be subject to change as more data is accumulated, as we learn more about the disease, and and, and we're learning more and more because we do have biologics that if you change the course of these mechanisms of action, these pathogenic, these biological pathways that are involved. Um, but the best, uh, this is the best uh, based on what you know the information we have at hand in our clinical experience. Mm. Well, I, I really appreciate you walking through each of these criteria and offering the perspective. I encourage our listeners to read this yourself uh, and keep this conversation in mind as you kind of look through the specific details of each one. So I have to ask you, how should clinicians utilize this in practice? Is this going to change management in any way? Well, I think it's clear and uh, there is a follow-up editorial that is not from the organizations but from individuals it's uh, co-authored by mitch grayson and uh, paul williams uh that really spell that out you know answer that question that this is really meant for uh, research purposes uh this is not meant for clinical use and i think your case your question about exercise induced uh bronchospasm and, and using the frequent use of short acting beta agonists is, is a case in point. Um, so it's really, I think, uh, important that clinicians recognize they should continue to manage their patients according to NHLBI, EPR4, and Xena guidelines, whichever one they find is more reasonable for their patients. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that at least for the mild, intermittent, the mild, uh, population. I really feel that Gina is, is probably more relevant for our population, but they tend to then converge more and have more in common when you start uh, getting to the moderate to severe cases. But uh, so, uh, but that being said, uh, continue to manage patients uh, according to these guidelines. Uh, and uh, these are really, these definitions are there. It's, it, we now have something in print. Uh, and it's something that industry needs to look at when they start using these terms uh, to lay claims to what their drugs do or don't do. Uh, and uh, I think it also starts to begin the conversation of consensus definitions, because that's one thing we struggle with. We have so many different organizations and we have so many uh, different uh, viewpoints that so we need to have common terminologies. We need to have common definitions for key uh, critical defining points uh, like remission or cure or control. Uh, and we should be talking apples to apples, not apples to oranges when we talk about our patients.
Well, I, I think that was a perfect summary. And, um, you know, I, Dr. Bernstein, I can't thank you enough for spending time with us and walking through this document. I have no doubt it's going to generate a lot of questions amongst our colleagues, and I'm hopeful that this will provide more insight and perspective for them. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add before we depart? No, I think uh, this is great. I think that uh, I'd like to see more of these initiatives uh, where we do have, you know, these types of inter-organization collaborations. And I think we do that quite well now. Uh, and it's nice that we have APS involved. And that um, I think we're doing this now more and more with uh, other diseases that we're treating, like urticaria and angioedema. We have interdisciplinary, uh, inter-organizational collaborations. And that's uh, very important. Uh, to uh, make sure that our, our, our colleagues are not confused, uh, that they aren't getting different messages about what they should and shouldn't do with regarding managing their patients. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'll never forget during your first podcast with us a few months ago, you mentioned that game you play with with learners of all levels of you challenge them to name a specialty of which allergy and immunology does not overlap. Um, that I, That's fantastic. Yeah, and I use that in a recent message too, because I think it's so important that we recognize the broad scope of practice and uh, and uh, and I think that's another thing we'll see with the next meeting is that there is a, the neuroimmunology is really speaking to that point uh, that we have to be uh, much broader we, we have gone well beyond the early days of allergy where all we talked about was aerobiology. Now we're talking about so much more, and not that aerobiology is not important, it is, but uh, it's only a small part of what we do at, at this point. Yeah. Well, Dr. Bernstein, thank you again. Thank you very much, Dave. We hope you enjoyed listening to today's episode. Please visit www.aaai.org for show notes and any pertinent links from today's conversation. If you like the show, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify so you can receive new episodes in the future. Thank you again for listening.